five slides tonight. <laughs> right? Um, but I think uh, a lot of it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, we're going to start off with things that you already uh, know, which we talked about last time. We're going to look at the what we're going to call the event line. And so I'm going to put this up here. If you have a piece of paper, then um, you can go ahead and start making some notes. We're looking at tonight the idea that your Bible is one story, one overarching story from one side of the cover to the other side. We can look at what the whole Bible talks about with that one story. And then we're going to dig in and see the nuances of that story. Um, and we're going to continue that discussion for the rest of our course because there's so many things about Scripture and about the Bible that you have in your hands. Um, but our, we want to talk tonight specifically about the one story. And so let's start off with kind of breaking it down what we're going to talk about tonight. There are four reasons for the story. We're looking at those four reasons. We're going to look at the six promises that are in the Bible. Six promises made by God in the Bible. And when we look at the reasons and the promises, we begin to see a character develop of who God is. He's revealing himself in a powerful way through the stories um, that we see in Scripture. We see these reasons and we see these promises. And then we also are going to look at the seven genres of Scripture. And what that means is that there's going to be, that the Bible is also, it's one story, but there's storytellers. There's many different storytellers. And those storytellers, we're going to call those the genres. Different ways people told the story uh, of, of who God is and his action. And then lastly, we're going to look at the idea this is one God, all people. And we'll explain what that looks like here in just a second. I think I'm going to surprise you at the very end of what's, what's going to happen. So, uh, four reasons, six promises, seven genres, one God, all people, 45 slides. You ready? Let's do this. All right. So, you guys remember this? If you want to write this, draw this uh, diagram on a piece of paper uh, real quick, and then uh, every week we're going to do this. So, we're going to start off with a blank timeline or event line, and we're going to fill out together, right? So, let's go ahead and look, draw this here. So, three dashes. And this little H sideways H shape. And don't forget this little piece right here. Okay, you got it? All right. So these, uh, did I already switch them on? Yeah. I cheated. Uh, don't look. All right. So let's first start off with these four dashes. Do you guys remember what they are? Do you remember the hand signals? All right, one. <laughs> All right, if somebody remembers, how many of you were not here last week? Raise your hand. One, two, three. Okay, so if somebody remembers what they were, stand up and let's see if they can do it. Ready? So creation, yeah, and then fall, and then flood, tower of Babel. So in here, these four dashes, the main events of those first four dashes are this, creation. Okay, this is the flower opening up. So creation, then the fall, then the flood, and then the Tower of Babel. And we put those on the dashes kind of separate from the timeline because we call those prehistory. We don't have a date for those. We don't know what dates those things are. Some people have tried to put some dates, and there are some dates, some good guesses for some dates. But honestly speaking, we don't have a necessary date for those events that, that happened. We know they happen. Jesus referred to them often. Uh, but uh, we don't have a time frame of when they start. So, what you're going to put down on your paper are these letters. The creation, fall, flood, and battle. That's what those, those four letters mean. Got it? So, you ready? Here's your first quiz. I'm going to start right here. If this is the first, what is this? Oh. Don't laugh at me, Brian. What is this? Flood. Ready? Right, begin. Here we go. Yes. Tower of Babel. You'll be amazed that once you get this timeline or event line down in your head, and at least just have pieces of it, that when you start seeing things event in scriptures, you'll be able to go, that's where that goes. That's where that goes. That's where that goes. And what happens is you begin to be more confident about your ability to interpret scripture, to read scripture. 
And that's that's almost half the battle because a lot of people look at their Bible and go, oh, this is this is hard. It's not hard. Um, it takes some dedication, takes some work. But if we can get this basic timeline down, event line, because there's no date line, event line down, then I think you'll be you'll see how you're it, you you will be encouraged in your Bible reading. All right. Now we're going to talk about this line here. This is where we can talk about some dates. I'm not going to put dates on here. You want to research those yourselves. You can. Because really, I'm more concerned with what is happening. All right, so we fill out some of these last time. Do you guys remember what this first thing is right here in this slide right here? Patriarchs. Patriarchs, right? So there's a, there'll be a P right there. So patriarchs, who's a patriarch? Abraham, Abraham Isaac, Jacob. Those are, those are the, the patriarchs. Um, those are some great stories. Stories of fallibility. <laughs> stories of people that made some serious mistakes. I heard someone say... Um, so are we supposed to emulate all the characters in the Bible? Oh, goodness <laughs> gracious, no. <laughs> right? um, but, they, but we are supposed to connect with them. We're supposed to identify with them. And that's one of the, powers, that's one of the powerful things about Scripture. A lot of other holy books have their characters as these magnificent myth mythological type of heroes. They're impervious. Um, but here in Scripture, with this holy book, we have real people. Real people that make real people. Real big mistakes. Uh, and we see some really powerful actions of God. So, patriarchs. What's the next letter? You guys remember? E. The Exodus. So it's an E. Exodus. Okay, so there'll be, there'll be a P. There'll be an E. What's next? Oh, conquest. The, the, the conquest. Yes. Right. Good job. Right? I forgot to talk about the, the Judah and Israel. So, Judah is the bottom line. Israel is the top line. We'll talk about that today. Oh, so, are you doing remember conquest, conquest of what? Conquest, con yeah, so conquest of Canaan. Canaan. Right. Canaan. So, you can also put Canaan, can also be the sea, can also be Canaan. So, it's the conquest of Canaan. So, with this basic idea, we have some of the, uh, we've identified the patriarchs. Who's a major hero of, of uh, Egypt or, or of the Exodus? What is that? Moses. Moses, yeah. Can we think of some other people? Yeah, Miriam, Aaron. Um, all right, the conquest. We talk about conquest. This is going into the, the to, into the promised land. Well, who's involved with that? Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. Those spies that go in there and they, they take over and they and they, they conquer. Some great stories from there. Um, I want to add some new stuff. So this is old from last week. We catch. We caught up. You good to go? Feel good. All right. Let's add some stuff. You ready? So I'm going to add right here a W. Yeah, you what is that? No, I didn't. What is that? Oh, no. <laughs> what is that? The W is the wandering. Yes, the wilderness, wandering, whatever, how you want to put it. The, the wilderness and the wandering. The reason why we want, to, we want to put it in there is because some uh, very valuable and important things happened during that wandering time. Again, some things that were not so good. But we see a lot of the things that God does, some of those reasons that we see in Scripture that happened because of the wandering. It was not a fun time. Wouldn't want to be a part of that. For the, for, I would not want to be a part of that wandering time. Um, I don't like snakes. Apparently there's some snakes going on in the wandering. Um, I don't like the desert. And I have no idea what manna would taste like, but apparently it's just stuff, right? All right, so the wilderness wandering right here. If you want to remember, this is why I put the W in there. What is this? How can you remember this? Pew. Pew. See, because it's right. You were thinking what? Where we used to sit, those are pews. Those are pews, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> however you want to remember that. So, um, let's go start from the beginning, right? So, the beginning is what? We have over here. Did I miss something, Joe? No. I'm Creation. 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 Fall. Fall. Flood. 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 Okay, then we're going to jump into the real timeline. Patriarchs. Patriarchs. That we have. It's right there. It's, it's, yeah, right. It's okay. Patriarchs. <laughs> Patriarchs. And then we have Exodus. Yes. Conquest. Okay. Good job. I got a couple more things to, 
to put on the time limit, and then we'll go on to our studies. In between the letters? No. What's that? Yeah. Nothing, in, nothing between the letters. Well, I, then I put some space in here. So well, we didn't. Well, I just, <laughs> <laughs> what was my first instruction? Draw exactly what's up on this poster. <laughs> 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 Uh, a J. What's the J stand? Jehovah. Just the judges. Oh man! If you want to read big stories, read Judges. My favorite is Ehud. <laughs> that dude was crazy, um, and his story is even crazier. Who's another judge? Samson. Samson. I mean, yeah, he's a big, big. He, he's he's a big one. Deborah. Deborah. Yes, I love Deborah. I, I want to so mentioning Deborah um, throughout our study this this session, um, and when I do this with Kings Academy, I, I I always make sure to emphasize one of the things that our current culture says about the Bible is that it's highly and misogynistic. I want to say you haven't read your Bible. Um, Deborah is a powerful story about a woman leading uh, in 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 this big event. And so, if you want to know more about Deborah, look at look at some of the things in Deborah. What's another judge that's your favorite? Gideon. What'd you say? Gideon. Gideon. Yeah, Gideon. He's the we, we often, that's where we get the whole passing out the fleece or tossing out the fleece is because of this Gideon story. Um, so judges, some powerful things happen with the judges. Now, we're going to move into what we're going to call the United Kingdom because one of the last judges that we often always forget was a judge was Samuel. So I want you to do this. Put that S in there. If you can, if you have to redraw your, your event line, that's okay. Next week, we have handouts. Yeah. Why would you start you, you. Okay, so here's the reason why I, I don't want to do a handout because I want you to practice drawing it because there might be a time you might be at a restaurant and you want to write this out because this might be part of your discussion of what scripture is. Imagine being able to, to, to take a napkin and talk about scripture and say this, 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 and be able to draw this out. We just have a Um It's 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 a pretty cool thing. So uh, Samuel was a judge, but he was also um, one of the earlier prophets. So at the beginning, uh, he you can you can consider him a prophet. Another prophet before him would have been Moses, and so uh, Samuel was uh, a judge prophet, right? Just say it all together real fast, and you'll be fine. Judge prophet. Um, some of the things that, that that happened to Samuel and God did through Samuel. Some again, again, some great stories through Samuel. Um, what did Samuel do? What was the biggest thing he was known for? He anointed Saul. He anointed Saul and he anointed David. David. Oh, All right. So this is the last <laughs> thing. <laughs> I know. I know. So in parentheses, what we're doing with the parentheses is we're putting them all together because this is the United Kingdom. There were three kings in the United Kingdom. Who were they? Saul, David, and Solomon. Saul, David, Solomon. And then after Solomon is when the kingdom split. Everybody go, oh. oh well, it probably was more painful than that. But um, do it again. Ready? The, the kingdom split. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, the kingdom split. But we want to put Samuel above uh, Saul and David. Samuel died a little bit after he anointed David. So um, his influence. My favorite story is actually something that cause, uh, causes some confusion um, is when Saul goes to the witch Ooh, of Endor and, and, and asks the ghost of Saul to come, to come and help him know something. And the witch of Endor is like, sure, I'll do it. And so she does it and something really happens. And she's just as ner nervous and scared because whatever she was trying to do <laughs> really worked apparently. And so all of a sudden here's Samuel and then my favorite part of it is when Saul says, tell me what my future's like. And Samuel's like, I'm dead. I don't know. <laughs> and doesn't help Saul. Great story. I love it. Um, so, um, 
Do you mind if I put one more thing on your chapter? Alright. But it's not here. I want you to know at least know one thing. Two things. Alright. So when the kingdom split, this is easy. When the kingdom split, Israel is on the northern tribe. So, so if you look at a map, Israel's north, Judah's in the south. That's why I put it this way. Um, Israel had 10 dynasties. They had Each of them had about 20. There was 19 kings and 20 kings. But the crazy thing that I want you to, 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 to get from this right here is that Israel had 10 dynasties. What that means is there were 10 different houses that were ruling over Israel. And some of them were like uh, the, a servant of the king became king. Uh, captains of armies became kings. There were even some that were not even Jewish, not even not even connected to Israel at all, became king. There was one in particular we can think of that ruled like a king that wasn't a king. Who was that? She was a wicked person. Jezebel. Jezebel, right? So, um, but then we have at the bottom of Judah, we have only one dynasty. So 10 dynasties, 10 houses for Israel. For Judah, just one. Can you guess? The house of David. The house of David. So we have, throughout throughout the timeline of all the kings of, of Judah, there were all sons and related to, um, to David. Um, we'll be able to talk a lot more about this. Uh, and we're going to cover this every single week. So if you feel like you're behind this week or feel like you're a little nervous about this, we're going to go over it again and again and again. Because I want you to get this, this basic timeline. Is it simple? Pretty easy? If your timeline was bigger, would it be easier? Yes. Okay. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll do a, a handout next time. Just with the lines. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a bigger font. All right. Let's get started. You guys ready? <laughs> What's that? She said, use a bigger font, maybe. Oh, right. <laughs> Your Bible is a story. There are four reasons in the story. Since we're talking about eat your Bible, here's how I want you to think of it. Um, my wife makes a gumbo. It's good. It's a good gumbo. Um, but you can think of a stew if you want to. Um, but you can think of a stew, a soup, a chili. But every one of those has a base. There's, there's a, there is a, 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 a liquid that carries them all. With the, a with the gumbo, it's the roux. Uh, with the chili, it's, it's the sauce. With the soup, it's the water. But it's all flavored in certain ways. But um, in every single bite, you're going to get the base of what's carrying this, this, this soup or chili or gumbo. I'd rather prefer a gumbo. So when we're talking about the story, every time you look into Scripture, you're going to see something of one of these four reasons. Let's take a look at the examples of this. So the first reason, the reason why you see what God is, God is doing something for a, for, a, for a purpose and for a reason in Scripture. And you see this over and over and over again from Genesis to Revelation. You see that God is wanting to have a residence. He wants to be with his people. You see this in the Old Testament. You see this in Genesis. God wants to be with his people. In, in the creation story, he wants to be with his people. All throughout the wilderness wanderings, what is he saying? I want to be with you. I want to, I want to tabernacle with you. So let's look at some verses. Genesis 2-7. I love this. Then, God, the, the, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being, created to have a residence with God. God, God created Adam to have, to be with him. We'll look at some other things too. A living being. Let's look at another verse. Exodus 29, 46. God says, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. That was a powerful passage. John 14, 16 through 18. And now this is Jesus speaking. Now I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another helper 
to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So we, we see this movement from God saying, I want to tabernacle with you. I want to be a neighbor. I want to be amongst you. To here we have another powerful movement when Jesus says, I don't want to be just be a neighbor. I don't want to just dwell alongside you. I want to be in you. That's why we talk about eat your Bible. We want to, to, to take what's on the outside and put it on the inside. Here, John, here Jesus is saying, I will be in you. I put off John chapter 14, verse 18, because every time I want to read that, I cry. <laughs> um, John 14, 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I mean, there's some powerful examples throughout all of Scripture where Jesus, where God says, I want to reside with you. I want to be, I want us to reside and be in residence together. So that's one of the reasons. One story is residence. God is saying, I want to reside with you. Next thing, God says, I want to reveal things to you. I don't want to just uh, be a be one of those. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a belief about who God is called a deist. If you're a deist, what that means is you believe there's a God, but what? What kind of God is it? Are you? Absolutely. If you're a deist, you're just, you just it's like you you kind of. Uh, uh, Hold the string of, of the top of the world and create everything, and then just stood back and said, "Y'all do what you want to do." It's not really God. The God of the Bible is a God that is involved with His people. He is revealing Himself in many different ways, and and through many different voices. So this revelation is one of the distinctive aspects of the, the story of the Bible. So the first one that we have is Genesis four. Six through seven. This is one of my favorite, favorite examples of God speaking and wanting to reveal Himself. This is right after or right before um, Cain kills Abel. Right before. Look what God says. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Can you imagine? I mean, God is, God is, God is telling Cain what to do, how to act. He's telling Cain, don't do this. I can see where your anger is going to lead you, and you, you, you can rule over it. He's speaking revelation to Cain. Of course, we know the story. Cain didn't listen. His anger got too much. Couldn't control it or didn't control it, whichever is the case. But God says, I want to reveal of something to Cain of myself. And that is, I see grace all over this right here. Here's another one. I love this one. This is Paul, Acts 18, 9. He is in Ephesus. And, and, and he's about ready to be, um, uh, he's already been uh, beaten and arrested several times already. And now he's about ready to go into a community where he knows it's going to happen again. He knows it's going to happen again. This is Paul, the great apostle. Look what God says to Paul. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack you and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. Uh, the Greek, uh, this this um, article is actually a two, T-O. So it's really saying, and no one is going to attack you, to harm you. So God's saying, people are going to attack you, but they're not going to be able to harm you. Do you think he's talking physically? Do you think he's talking emotionally, mentally, spiritually? Which one? My guess? Spiritually. Because... They, do, they end up doing some, some, some pretty hurtful things to, to Paul. But look at this message. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Keep on going. I mean, um, th there's, there's a moment in Scripture where you see uh, Jesus at the Transfiguration. He's on the, on the mountaintop, and Peter's there, and Peter sees two other people speaking with Jesus. And, and, and I don't know how, how, they, how they knew this, but it was Elijah and it was Moses. And they were giving encouragement to Jesus. Um, this same God is giving encouragement to Paul in the same way. Keep 
ongoing. Has there been times in your life where you've had this had this desire to stop? There's another passage in, in some of Paul's letters where he says, I was in despair. Despair unto death. So what he's basically saying is, I wanted to die. Dying was preferable to, 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 the, to the kind of pressure that I was receiving. But here God says, do, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. God's revelation. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So we're looking at the revelation of who God is. God, God's the story that we see in Scripture is all about Him revealing Himself. I, I talk about this to my students in, in, in my Bible class. We look at cre creation. We look at the nature of creation. And we look at our planet that seems to be perfectly, perfectly designed for life. But not just any kind of life, a specific kind of life. A kind of, a kind of life that thinks and knows and, and can act on its own volition. And not just that, but it can also think on a moral basis, a spiritual basis. So God designed to us to receive his re revelation. He designed us to be able to hear his voice. Where he's designed us to be able to, 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 to act upon his urgings. To act upon his, his instructions. That's what we're designed to. So he wants to speak to us. So in this story, one story, we see God revealing himself. What's another one? Relationship. Uh, I don't think there's anything we can I can show you in Scripture, so I want to turn it to you. I want you guys to kind of talk amongst yourselves, find some things. Here's the question. Let's spend some time together here. What scriptures do you know? Or what scriptures can you find that describe the quality of the relationship God wants to have? Some of us already have like a verse that's very important to us. So share that amongst the table. Speak into each other's lives about the kind of relationship that God wants us to have, the quality of the relationship, the, the depth of it, the, the, the purpose behind it. Um, I already shared you what mine is, uh, John 14, 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you alone. So, I turn to you. We'll spend uh, five, maybe six, seven minutes talking to each other. And then we'll share what, you, what you've learned. I want you to share with, with each other what the table begins to experience. If you don't know who you are on the table, this is a perfect chance to introduce each other. Your turn. <laughs> I also while you guys are sharing let me say let me speak into this for a second I see somebody got your phones out so um, a lot of times you won't hear me say you can go ahead and google this and because if you google like what does God want to do with my life oh uh, my gosh <laughs> what you're going to get but if you're looking for, like you say, what's the verse that this says, it'll, it'll find it really fast. So when it comes to like using, your, using the internet as your concordance, it'll find it real fast. And so there's a lot of value. Um, open Bible, uh, Blue Letter Bible, uh, Bible Gateway, those are some things. I, when I see those pop up on my, on my search, I'll always go to those sites. Um, so when it comes to using your Bible as a concordance, yeah, or uh, I'm sorry, using your computer and Google as a concordance, uh, you're not going to find much dangerous things. It's when you start getting into interpretation 
that I will find some ways to encourage you to, to on sites that are, that are trustworthy. So. What is the problem with that? Yeah. 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 But I don't think back to the podcast where some John because his first one is yes, there's a because of the all of the passion, zeal, fervor, yes, first one. So, um, do you know, you've seen people who are really doing some crazy things. Because they just are crazy about somebody. Guys will do crazy things. And they'll make a fool of themselves because they're kind of a person that's And that's personal. All right, give you the one minute warning. Be prepared to share from your table. The most powerful. And, um, Lay aside his power, glory, and his majesty. When you do all that, the first time. Yes, that one. It's a tiny bit. It's a single thing. I think it's kind of a type of relationship that he wants. He's like, I don't want this. Okay, here we go. Who wants to be the first table? Who wants to be the first table? All right. Okay. So are we supposed to... Like have one spokesperson, or do we just bounce? Yeah, like, yes, you do. You do whatever. Well, I was going to share Kathy. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, Kathy's favorite is Micah six eight, which says what? Which talks about to live righteously and walk humbly, and and just uh, yeah, what does the Lord require of you? Yeah, just a basic. This is how I would like you to act, please. Definitely love mercy. And love mercy, yeah. Okay, yeah. Love mercy, that one. So I told him that I like the part about walk humbly with God because um, I used to, when I was younger, I would just like run along in front of him and pull him along with me because I, my ideas were so good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've kind of learned a little bit more about if, if you got if you just do what I want you to do, this will work out great. I'd bother you less, right? <laughs> I wouldn't pray as much. What's another one? Other table. Yeah, it's Mark. Okay, Romans 15, 13. Paul was signing off. He was going to go to Romans. But he, he discussed the Holy Spirit and how the indwelling of the Holy Spirit creates his, or is this relationship. It's the embodiment of the relationship that we have. 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy in Jesus and believe you, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love that one. I'm writing these down, so if you want to take a picture when we're all done, it's good. What's another table? Thank you, Mark. Another one. I'm going to, I'm going to point at a table if you're not. Yes. We had so many. We had a lot of them on our table. But we, we settled on two chapters, Ephesians 1 and 2. Okay, so whole chapters, right? That tells us all the things we are in them. 
and I'll just try to find it in my notes. I'll tell you a few of them if I can find it back in my notes. Um, we are blessed, chosen, holy, and blameless, his adopted daughter, redeemed, forgiven, an heir, sealed with the Holy Spirit, loved, alive together with Christ, saved, created in Christ Jesus, bought near by the blood of Christ, reconciled to God, a child of God. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> right. right? That's awesome. Ephesians 1 and 2, what was yours? Uh, Philippians 4, uh, 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. I mean, really, when you think about it, I mean, to, to say that the peace of God will guard your heart, I should have thought of that this morning. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Philippians 4, 6 through 7. That's awesome. Yes. Another one. Genesis 28, 15. Okay. What's it say? Um, it says, basically, I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you may go. Okay. Wherever you may go. Do you know what that means? It means wherever you may go. Um, there, there's there's some powerful symbols in in, in yeah. other other verses. I'm, I'm thinking Psalms where um, you, you can't go down to the deepest parts of hell and not be where God is. Is it? I don't know how to do that sounds, but you know what I mean, like, right? There's nowhere you can go that is outside of God's presence. There's nowhere that you can go. And so being able to say you you going anywhere now. What that also means is that. Sometimes we may be taking God in some taking God in some pretty horrible places, but we we don't want to do that. But the beauty of that is, God's right there. I think I told you, uh, or we did talk about it in one of Shannon's classes about suffering, is that uh, when our friend of, a friend of ours had a ministry in Alaska to Alaskan prostitutes who were trying to get out of prostitution, and the thing that that they would say is and counsel is. Let's talk about your life, where you where you came from. They're like, I don't want to talk about that. I said, Hold on, we want to try to find where God was in your past, because if we can find places where you can say, I think that's what God was doing. God was right there. Now I ignored him, but God's right there, and God's right there. Guess what that means? God's going to be there and going to be there and going to be there. If He was there, He's going to be there, right? So there's nowhere. I love that. Genesis twenty fifteen. What's another one? I only got one more, two more tables. No, one more. It's your table. What's yours? My, mine's really simple. It's a James seven and eight, or James four seven and eight. Uh, submit there, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You see, in movies, and and you're, if you want to see a good theology of who Satan is, just watch any movie. Not just kidding, right? Um, Satan. Please, with with that, there there is a protection. Not just of God will be anywhere, but He will protect you from the most, the most vile, the one that lies the most. He'll protect you from that. Some awesome things. If you can read my handwriting, uh, then these are some powerful verses that you can think of that you can go to when it comes to that. Love that. Any other verse before we go on to the next one? Yes, First John four. 19. And you guys can finish this. It says, We love him because. So we normally look at that verse as a progression. Like he made the first move, he first loved us, and so therefore we love him because he took the first step. But I also look at it in the sense that um, the problem with the Ephesus church was they left their first love. Their first love. And their problem was zeal. They left their zeal. So when you look at that verse in First John where it says we love him because he first loved us, it can also be looked at in the sense that he's not this, yeah, I love you. Yeah. If it changes, I'll let you know. It's this zealous, passionate, consuming, think of how you dated your to be wife. Yeah. And all the silly things you did because you first loved her. Yeah. First. So he loved us. Well, how was that work? Oh, passion. So if I can if I can build onto that, one of the things that when I was talking to teenagers, I would say, what's a confusing aspect or, or thing that you've seen people connect God with in an emotion? And one of them said jealousy. Yeah. How can God be a jealous God? 
I said, ho, 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 let me tell you. Um, and I said, let's think about this way. Let's say my wife was sitting right, standing right next to me, and a man walks in, and walks right up to Shannon and plants a kiss right on her. And you watch me, because that's what you're going to do. You're not going to watch, you're going to watch, you're going to see you're going to do, right? And I'm like, whatever. What does that speak of my love for my wife? Sad. Sad. Not just aw, oh, sad, but sad. <laughs> that's I have another one, Steve. Yes. Jeremiah 29, 13 kind of changed my, my life. Yeah. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. And, you know, for the, for a long time, I, did, I read my Bible regularly. I just, but I didn't, I didn't really get into it and study it. Like, when this verse, uh, when I really internalized this verse, I understood what God was saying when you seek me with your whole heart. And so that has been a life changer for me. Yeah, the, the whole heart, I'm thinking of one of my favorite other uh, stories in the scriptures when David is uh, the Ark of the Covenant's coming into the city of David, into the city. What does David do? He starts dancing, right? And he starts, like, I guess taking off his clothes while he's dancing. <laughs> and there's a servant going, What are you doing, David? You need to be a little more respectable, respectable. And he's like, you want to see respect? Watch this. And he just goes all out. It's that whole heart, wild zeal, uh, abandoned to what, for, for what God. That's the relationship. He pursues us with that. A lot of people have, and I'm kind of one of them to talk about that, that new, that, that I say new, it's the old now, but um, God's a reckless God, has used reckless love. I mean, but but there is some truth to that, that, that God's, to, to, to us, it seems like, you mean you're going to, break barriers down you're going to try to shatter my 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 you're gonna you're gonna abandon not abandon you're gonna go after me no matter where i'm at that just seems crazy um, my father-in-law could not get get a hold of that he felt like he was too far gone i'm like we're, shannon was like no it's 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 god is his it's a wild abandoned love for you there there isn't anything you can do that's going to change that great stuff great stuff let's see if i got 15 minutes left so I know there's more. If you want to email some more, then I can share this and put this on here. So I wanted to cover this, this slide with just a bunch of your verses of the relationship, the quality of relationship God has with us. It's one of the main aspects of this one story of God, the relationship that he wants to have with us. Your Bible is also a story about redemption, or restoration. Redemption that works too. <laughs> it's about restoration. Let's look at some verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Restoration of death. I, before I came here, I used to be a, I was a funeral director, assistant funeral director, and I saw my first dead body. And you know what I was profoundly impacted by? I was like, there ain't nothing this thing can do. I mean, it's, it was a profound sense of nothing. A profound sense of nothing. Um, but so being able to say, somebody asked me, uh, I can't remember what the question was, but uh, the, the action, the restoration that God has, he takes a dead person and makes them alive. Oh my gosh, what? But then he says, I'm going to take that alive person and make him an heir to the throne. <laughs> dead to heir? What is that about? Right? So, uh, it, so also in Christ, all should be made alive. Restoration, complete restoration. How about this one? Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. There's a, there's a nuance here with this renew their strength where it says that it's, it's like what God wants to do is exchange garments with you and get, take away your, take off your shredded, nasty garments and give you his garment. That gives strength. That gives that 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 power. So those who the Lord will renew their strength, restoration, complete restoration. So it's all about this. I love that the soul that on wings like eagles. This is this Revelation twenty one three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, "Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man." This is the descending of the new earth, the new Jerusalem. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Think of this for a second. Um, when we think of, when we think of the, the, the most relevant, no, not relevant, 
um, the big event that happens in Genesis, a lot of times people think of what's the fall. All right? Well, what's the big thing about Revelation? Well, it's the judgment of, of getting thrown into, into hell. Okay. But, but what about the beginning, before the fall? What was there before the fall? The garden. What's after, what's at the end of, at the, at the end of Revelation, at the very end, what is there? A garden. A restoration. What was, what was once destroyed, broken, isn't broken enough to be fully, completely restored by God. What started off in the garden, guess what's going to happen? It's going to end in the garden. <laughs> but if we forget that, if we cut off those ends of the Bible, guess what we end up with? Death, despair, and gloom, right? It's, it's, there's more to that. Remember about the garden on either side. The restoration is there. Um, I love in Revelation, I think it's 22, um, where uh, God, in, so God in one voice creates everything. And, in, and in, in Revelation 22, I think, God says another word and uncreates everything. So that all of a sudden, everything just goes, whoosh, and all that's left is you and God. That's it. Just you and God. And the restoration comes from that after, after that verse. I love it. I love it. All right. Let's move on to the next thing. I'll do we'll this pretty fast. Your Bible is also a promise. One of the things that we're going to talk about here is that there are these, this word called covenant. And so we're talking about a promise. We're talking about a covenant. So there are six promises in Scripture. Let's look at them real fast, but not so fast. The first covenant, the first promise was actually made to Adam. They call it the Edemic promise or the Edemic covenant. Basically, it's this. God says, I will enable and provide all things for you. That's the garden. I will give you what you need. I will enable you. You have the perfect environment. I will give you all that you need in the garden. I'll provide it for you, and I will enable you in all these things. You don't have to worry about what's good and what's evil. I will tell you that you, 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 there is nothing you are wanting in this relationship. Man's promise, we will rely. Until what happens? We won't. We won't. Until somebody else decides to come in and says, you know... There's this other thing out there, and it caused Adam and Eve to look outside of God's providence. So the Edemic covenant. <coughs> Second promise was to know it. This is an interesting one. God's promise. I will preserve the creation to be a place of continuous partnership. Man's promise, we will trust. I, don't, I, don't, I, I kind of want to make like these little pauses, but I don't need to, because we know what's going to happen, right? I'll preserve creation. This will never happen again like this. The flood will never happen. I will preserve creation because I want an environment, I want a place where we can continue to be in partnership. What they say, we'll do. Next one, the Abrahamic covenant. The promise. God will create a nation that will restore. So the, 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 the nation of Israel, what the family, the nation that was going to come from Abraham was, was supposed to be a nation that all other nations of the world would look to and go, look what's happening to them. That's amazing. We want to be like them. We want to go with them. And then we're going to be blessing the world. Man's promise. This is the one covenant that, that man did not have a part in. Adam had no part in the covenant of, of, of the Abrahamic covenant. Um, I wish I could go to the full story, but this is when Abraham fell asleep and there was the vision of the, the, the flaming pot going between the two cut, shut up, chop, chopped up pieces of the bowl. Crazy story, right? But it was God saying, I am making a covenant with myself that I will make a nation. And if I don't, may I be broken like these two, this half of creature, this half of a bowl. So man did man had no 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 part of this of this covenant. The one covenant I promise, God promises, is going to make a nation that will restore. Man had nothing to do with that. Next one is called the, the Mosaic covenant, the Moses promise, God's promise. God will establish meaning to being righteous. That's basically what the law was. I want to describe to you the meaning of being righteous. Guess what they say? We can do it. How far did that go? We can do it. <clears throat> Next one was a promise to David, the Davidic promise, the Davidic covenant. God will bring a king 
and a kingdom to rule and lead. Man promised we will follow. Right? So look at all these promises. The book is about a promise. I told you the Bible is about a promise, but I wrote, I've given you, I've given you uh, five promises here that they don't look good. God kept the promise, but man didn't. The covenant shattered. The covenant shattered until the New Testament. Jesus. Jesus will be the new covenant. <clears throat> the new covenant keeper that we could not be. So when Jesus says, I will be, I will be, uh, I'll be the one that, that, that follows and follows the King of David. I'll be the one who says we can do it with the law. I'll be the one who says, what well, I guess with the academic covenant, I'll be the one who continues a relationship. I'll be the one who trusts fully. With, with, with Jesus' new covenant, it transforms all the other covenants, encompasses all the other co uh, covenants. Uh, you see this in Hebrews. The, the, the greatness of, of, Je of the new covenant through Jesus, it, it, it just, um, it covers all things and becomes, Jesus becomes all these things with that we could not be. The things that we could not do, he says, I will do it. Which is, goes back to the, the, the uh, uh, Abrahamic covenant when he says, I will make a covenant with myself. This is what happens. This is Jesus. Jesus fulfills the covenant. Only Jesus can be the one to fulfill, to fulfill all these covenants because he is 100% what? Man. 100% man. But, so he's the only one who could fulfill those with the covenant, the promise between man and God. But the only one who had the power to do all these things is Jesus because he's also 100% God. The Bible is a promise. All right. We're going to move on. Look at that. i got three, four minutes left. The Bible has storytellers. One of my favorite places is a bookstore. And my dream is a library that looks just like that. Right? Books everywhere. Um, this is where I want to This is where I want to live. I want to live in a library. There was a bookstore in Fable, Arkansas. I forget what it was called. What was it called? Hannah? I forget what it was. It was in the corner of, of uh, Dixon Street. Uh, you walked in, and it was the, the aisles were like this big. You had to like walk this way, and there were books up to the twelve foot ceiling everywhere, just 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 stacked, just stacked everywhere. It was, and you walked in, you could smell glue and paper and, and old newspaper. So, um, the Bible has storytellers. We're going to talk about the seven genres of scripture, the seven ways that the Bible tells this one story. Okay. Dixon Street Bookstore. What's that? Dixon Street Bookstore. Dixon Street Bookstore. Thank you. That's exactly it. Um, very simple. It was on Dixon Street. Um, so when we talk about the storytellers, we talk about the genres, there are different ways that we read each genre. And if we misread and don't understand the genres, then we can misinterpret scripture. We'll talk about, talk about that in later weeks, but I want to show you what these genres are, who these storytellers are. The first one is narrative. The story of... When you think of a narrative, a narrative is like those gripping epic stories that you read in a book. Uh, Tom Clancy would be a narrative. So the story of David and Goliath, narrative. What's another narrative story in scripture that you can think of? Ruth. Ruth. It's a great story, Ruth. Um, another story would be Joseph. Another story would be... Most of Genesis. Most of Genesis, yeah. The, the, Genesis. All the, the patriarchal stories. It's a narrative. It's a story. One thing happens after another. Uh, my favorite, the book of Acts. I love the narrative that happens with the book of Acts. There's a narrative. There's a purpose. It tells us what happened. The narrative tells us what happened. Next genre is poetry. What's a good poetry that you can think of in Scripture? Psalms. Psalms. Um, Song of Solomon. Love Song of Solomon. It's great. Um, it tells us what to feel. Now, you understand, you can already see this now. If we try to interpret narrative, uh, uh, if we try to interpret poetry the same way we do with narrative, we're going to be a problem because poetry is very, very figurative. Yeah, they, they use a lot of symbolic language. And if we're trying to make a narrative, narrative is very, very fact oriented. So we can get confused if we're not careful about uh, reading one genre as another. Here's another genre, another story is the wisdom literature. 
This tells us how to live. Most of the prophets would be a, a, um, a wisdom literature. It tells us how to live. Wisdom literature. Ecclesiastes. Love Ecclesiastes. Do everything. Remember? That's Ecclesiastes. You guys do that, right? Yeah, that song by the birds, to everything, turn, turn, that's Ecclesiastes, right? <laughs> trivia, if you want to win trivia, that may be a trivia question. Prophecy. Um, tells us God's heart. A lot of times when people hear the word prophet, I'm a prophet, you usually think I'm a person who can tell the future. No. A prophet were, were the people that told and revealed what God's heart was on the subject. Told the king, the kings, this is what God's heart is on this subject. Now, some of that did include future telling. Some of that included past telling. But a lot, all of it was about telling God's heart. So, prophecy is, tells us what God's heart is. Narrative is, tells us what happened. Poetry tells us how to feel. Wisdom tells us how to live. Prophecy tells us God's heart. Next one, the Gospels. Um, the Gospels, it tells us Jesus' life and stories. It tells us what he did. It tells us what he said. Those are bi biographies, if you can say it that way. <clears throat> biographies, and they're um, great ones. Mike, what's, my, what's your favorite gospel? John. John. Yeah, mine's John. Mm -hmm. Maybe I like Mark. It's amazing. <laughs> I like Mark, then, right? <laughs> <laughs> the epistles. These are the letters that, um, that Paul mostly, but James wrote and John wrote, these are letters that they wrote to people, to churches, to communities. Um, and really, if you look at those, they tell us the New Covenant message. They tell us the, the heart of that New Covenant message. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of what we understand about how uh, the New Covenant and the Old Covenant tie together is because of Hebrews. Um, and I love the fact that we don't know who wrote Hebrews. I think that's powerful spoken, but we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Because... It doesn't matter, because if we knew who wrote it, then it would take away that mystery of this is really God's word when it comes to that. And, and I think Hebrews is perfect for that. So the epistles, last one, the apocalyptic literature. There's two of them, Revelation and what's the other one? It's Old Testament. What is it? Daniel. Daniel, Daniel. yes. Which is also narrative. Which is all, okay, yeah, some of those narrative too, yeah. So it tells us urgent messages symbolically. Which is, um, I, my Old Testament professor in, in college said, um, I don't think that, he says this, I don't think that we fully understand what Revelation is going to mean until our society becomes more like it was when Revelation was written. It's more of a nomadic, small culture. Um, he was a, he was a music guy. But, um, so, it tells us urgent messages symbolically. You see a lot of symbolism uh, in uh, Daniel. Uh, there was a picture, there was a meme on just uh, around Christmas time. A guy uh, made a, a biblically correct angel from the top of his tree. <laughs> and it was this monster looking thing. Um, very, very uh, had all these eyes on it over there. <laughs> it was fun. Um, so it, it, the, 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 the captain was like, Look, I just made an angel from my tree. And you're like, <laughs> um, All right, so. These are the storytellers. We'll talk more about how to draw out the truths from each of these styles, each of these storytelling uh, ways, uh, and to be able to dig, dig into these and recognize what's, what's poetry. Because a lot of times, like you've already mentioned, Daniel uh, is apoc apocalyptic literature, but there's also some narrative in there. Um, and so being able to recognize some of those clues that are left for us, but also be able to look at your Bible and the way that your Bible is written, some of the, it's structured, so there's some helps in there that maybe you didn't know about that says, oh, by the way, all uh, studies and, and all the theologians seem to agree that this is apocalyptic literature. This is going to be um, a narrative. So there's some helps that your Bible has inside of it uh, that a modern Bible will have that will help you understand and interpret these things. Uh, but also we will look at, look at it. Is there ways that we can tell from Scripture some of these clues? Mm -hmm.